Episode 2. Modder. Saturday, July 11th, 2037. Nine days before. Jaden had snatched a few hours sleep, a shower, and a change of clothes, but now decisions had to be made. Carlos and Riz followed Jaden into the kitchen. Jaden cracked their knuckles, deep in thought. How could they share what they had made without getting caught? What if Prota had already detected them? Jaden was nervous about what they had done, but couldn't let Carlos and Riz see that. They were following Jaden's lead, for once. It felt good. Besides, this was the only plan they had. Jaden reached for the crockpot-sized vitrovat on the counter, turning it on. A display flickered in the air, glitching like an old TV. Jaden gave the side of the vat a whack. The image stabilized, and Jaden scrolled through all the foods they couldn't afford. Expensive-looking breakfast burritos and fruit plates flew by until Jaden landed on the ramen icon and mashed the button three times. Bubbles filled the glass cylinder. Tiny lumps appeared, growing geometrically. They watched as clumps of flour and salt began to clabber together and multiply into noodles, spinning and twisting into knots in the bubbling water. Jaden turned to face the others. We gotta play it. I mean like, for real, outside, play it. Riz's eyes bulged. We can't play it. She said, throwing up her hands in protest. We put any of this on the network, and the admins will see it. Jaden walked over to the window, looking at the street below. We'll keep it all local. We won't link anything to our wallets, or broadside accounts, or Luminos IDs. Stay totally anon and offline. Ping. The ramen was ready. Carlos grabbed some plates, nodding in agreement. It seemed to Jaden that Carlos was genuinely unfazed by all this risk. He looked over at Riz. Hand me the ketchup. Riz looked at them both in complete disbelief. Aren't you guys scared? She said. What if Proto finds out? We'll keep it low-key. Jaden said, trying to sound confident. Just one game. Off network. Nothing tied to us. A test run. If it's good, we'll take it to Prota and sell it to them as, as like, DLC. An expansion pack. Jaden drained the vat. Steam rose with a hiss. Riz was thinking hard, but she didn't look convinced. Jaden slopped the ramen onto paper plates, handing them to Carlos one by one. We'll play somewhere, way off the grid. Carlos nodded. Nowhere a marshal patrol could find us. Jaden nodded at this, doing their best to persuade Riz. Jaden knew they could get in a lot of trouble. It still seemed like a better option than being homeless. But they had to convince Riz to go along with them. You're really telling me, you don't want to play this, one time? Jaden asked her. Riz sighed and looked at the floor. Carlos squeezed ketchup onto the ramen and handed it to her. Riz looked at the rubbery plate of noodles for a second before she nodded, taking it. All right. She mumbled. But just one time. We need to find somewhere hella private. She took a bite of the ramen, chewing on the thought. Who do we know with a big backyard, dumb enough to do this? The three members of Rug Mob dozed on loungers by the pool in Jason's well-manicured backyard in Marin County. A vast, sun-dappled lawn spread out around the glistening neon blue rectangle in front of them. Jason opened an eye, disturbed by a dancing phone icon, trilling. Why is Jaden calling you? Asked Taki, peering over his sunglasses at the caller ID. Jason frowned, confused. He hit answer anyway. Jaden's voice wafted into the air. Can you keep a secret, dickhead? Ding dong. Jason's doorbell sounded weighty. Jaden, Carlos, and Riz looked around, intimidated by the mansion's grandiose front porch. They were wearing brand new, freshly printed bone suits, animal skull helmets in hand. The armor was thicker, stronger, and multicolored. It looked a little rough around the edges in the light of day, but more than made up for it with personality. Jason opened the door. He was wearing his own rug mob branded version of the hacked armor, complete with a brand new rug mob jaw mask, covering his mouth. Jaden felt excited that he had already tinkered with the designs, and relieved. They'd taken a gamble contacting their arch rivals and sharing the hacked code with them. Rug Mob could have snitched, but Jaden didn't think it was their style. Rug Mob hadn't reported Skeleton Crew after catching Jaden in the league game. 
That was some dweeb up in the bleachers. Jaden's hunch was rug mob would see the potential of the hack, and from the way Jason, Shiv, and Taki played, Jaden knew they were okay with breaking the rules. Well? Jaden asked. How is it? Jason took off the jaw mask. A big grin spread across his face. Start. The two teams charged at each other across the huge lawn. Digital NFT armor and weapons were projected over their physical armor, also modded. They looked less like generic video game space marines and more like astronauts who had run away and joined the circus. Jaden's new bone suit felt great. It fitted perfectly. Being comfortable in their own skin gave Jaden a new sense of confidence. Jaden clutched a huge, exaggerated assault rifle of their own design overloaded with scopes, twin grenade launchers, and extended clips. It looked like something out of a cartoon. The bone suits were a little harder to operate than regular broadside gear. The interface had some bugs, and the armor and shock absorbers lagged more than usual. But it didn't matter. They were running faster than regular bone suits allowed, colored speed lines trailing in their wakes. They could jump higher. Explosions were brighter. Everything was bigger. Everything was louder. Jaden covered Carlos as he charged at Jason, spraying him with a torrent of bullets. Jason fired back ripsaw blades. Carlos veered away as the blades tore into his digital armor. He saw a winged pill icon flapping its way through the sky above him. He jumped at the power-up, catching it. His health recovered, and his gun and digital armor grew larger. He landed, unleashing giant bullets that homed in on Jason. Jason's health level plummeted. Oversized rounds smashed into him, destroying panel after panel of digital armor. He slid into cover behind a tree trunk. Carlos strafed around the tree to finish him, savoring the moment. Gia, you just got dangled, boy. Carlos bellowed. Bones up, kid. Come on out. Let's. Fleck. Shiv ambushed Carlos, swinging a huge burning axe. Carlos's body flew across the lawn. Flames enveloped his digital armor as it shrank down to its normal size. He crash landed beside a boulder, dropping his gun. He looked up, a sliver of energy keeping him in the game. Now he was caught between a rock and Shiv. Shiv whirled the burning axe overhead, flames whipping the air like helicopter blades. Carlos edged away. He reached out, drawing a red X with his finger on the ground, just in front of Shiv, who looked confused. Whatever this paintbrush app was, it was not a standard feature of Broadside. Shiv roared, swinging the axe faster. Got him? Carlos whispered into his radio. Across the lawn, high in a tree, Jaden crouched, aiming a double-barreled sniper rifle. They couldn't see Shiv yet. Another tree blocked the view, but could see the red X. Got him. Jaden replied. Shiv took the bait, swinging at Carlos, stepping forward onto the marker, bringing the axe down hard. Poplow. Shiv's head snapped back as the twin sniper rounds caught them between the eyes. They fell to the ground, yowling in pain. The axe disappeared in a shower of pixels just before it could connect with Carlos. Warhead, Merc Shiv. Carlos laughed, scrambling to his feet. What the? Who made all these new features? Asked Shiv. We thought you guys did, replied Carlos. I shared the code with some of the other teams. It's no big. Jason replied over the radio. I don't know who added that paint thing to the map, but it's sick, right? Riz caught up to Carlos, hearing Jason on the radio too. Jason, did you just say other teams? Did you put this on? On a cloud server? Riz asked in disbelief. Jason's voice came back over the radio. Don't worry, crybaby. No one knows who made it. They won't find you or your little hacker friend, Warhead. Riz went red at this. Jason, we told you not to. Bob Lau. Jason appeared behind Riz, discharging a three-barreled shotgun, point blank into Riz's back. Jason, cheap shots Riz. Sumi, Habibi, crowed Jason as he hurtled Riz's falling body. Jaden watched from their vantage point, suddenly going cold inside their bone suit. Jason had shared the code? With who? Carlos distracted Jaden from the thought as he charged in the opposite direction from Jason, only to run into Taki. Taki raised a four-barreled nail cannon, pointing it at Carlos. Taki grinned. Carlos shouted into his radio as Taki bore down on him. Jaden, get over here. We gotta. 
Blam, 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 blam. Taki pinned Carlos to the ground, needlessly unloading the whole magazine. He moaned in pain, flinching as the haptics in his bone suit reacted to each digital nail. He looked like a pincushion. Taki, nails Carlos. Jason ran past Carlos and sprang upwards. He vaulted off a tree trunk, reached up, and snatched the NFT flag, floating by a branch above. Rug mob, have the flag. Jaden saw the word scrolling through the air, jumped down from their vantage point, and sprinted through the bushes towards the others. They would find out exactly who Jason had shared the code with. But first, Jaden was going to pawn him, once and for all. Jason bailed with the flag. Taki and Shiv followed, covering him. Jaden and Riz were close behind, blasting. Shiv produced a small cartoon bomb as they ran, complete with crackling fuse. Shiv raised a rippling arm to hurl the bomb, just as Jaden raised the sniper rifle. Blap! Warhead, no scope, Shiv. Too easy. Shiv hit the deck. But just before their digital armor disappeared, Shiv managed to hike the bomb into the air. Jaden dived. Riz froze. Blam! Shiv explodes Riz. Jason and Taki sped on. Let's finish this! Jason cried. Jaden got back on their feet, racing after Jason. Taki appeared from behind, wielding a red-hot plasma scythe. What the hell is that? Cried Jaden. Taki shrugged. Jaden could see Taki's thick pink eye shadow through his visor. Found it on the server. Taki said, winking. Jaden's mind was racing just as fast as they were running away from Taki. If there were NFT weapons they hadn't made being uploaded to servers, it meant other people were modding the code too, minting new NFTs, and maybe not being as careful to cloak their identities and cover their tracks. This was not good. Jaden sped up, pulling away from Taki, producing a small ballistic throwing star they designed from their weapons inventory. Taki got closer. Close enough. Taki raised the scythe, ready to cut Jaden in half. That was when Jaden stopped dead, crouching in a ball on the floor, like a hedgehog. Taki tried to stop, but it was too late. Taki slammed into Jaden's back, flipping head over heels, dropping the scythe as he rolled through the dirt. Taki sat up, dizzy. Chuck! The ballistic throwing star buried itself in Taki's helmet. It began to glow white hot for a second and... Plume! Warhead! Nukes Taki. Jaden ran on, snatching the plasma scythe from Taki. Jaden made a fast break in the other direction to flank Jason, skidding into the undergrowth as they spotted him up ahead. He was carrying the flag towards the rug mob base, coming their way. Jaden smiled. It was time to end this kid. Carlos's voice came over the radio. Jaden, keep him busy. We're almost there. He's not getting past me. Jaden pulled a silver square with a QR code on it from their bone suit pocket, their last custom NFT holotag. Carlos's voice cut over the radio again. Just wait up. For once in your damn. Jaden muted him, creeping forward and tossing the NFT holotag out of the bushes onto the path. A life-size 3D image of Jaden in a default broadside armor appeared, looking in Jason's direction, aiming an assault rifle. It wasn't the perfect plan, the image was of their old armor, but Jaden only needed Jason distracted for a split second. Jason saw it. He charged forward, flag in one hand, firing his gun at the holographic image with the other. Jaden smiled, stormed out of the bushes, and raised the scythe. Its blade glinted, pulsing with heat. Jason skidded to a stop, turned, and looked at the real Jaden. Like he was expecting this. Jaden realized what they'd walked into at the same time as Shiv lunged from the bushes. Crunch! Shiv's lumpy fist sent Jaden into orbit, crash landing at Jason's feet. Shiv broadsides warhead. Jaden sat up, winded, processing the humiliation of history repeating itself inside of 24 hours. Jason shook his head. A holotag decoy? What are you, five? Jaden looked up at him, wheezing, unable to respond once again. Shiv walked over too, laughing, stamping out the NFT tag of Jaden like a cigarette butt. Oldest trick in the book, Ashat. Down the street, someone else was watching the broadside game through a sniper's scope. A sharp shot, a robot from the same family as Marshall's, watched from its vantage point at the top of a redwood tree. The robot was thinner, 
and more delicate than a Marshall, but with the same traffic cone colorway. It had a long sniper rifle for an arm. Its single blue eye was as large as a telephoto lens. It focused in on the action. Somewhere else, the sharp shots footage streamed onto a large screen. The screen was floating in a sleek, spacious office high above the city, the only thing in the room illuminating the woman watching it. Jane Stratton zoomed in on Jaden's head, face still hidden by their animal skull helmet. Jane watched with interest as Jaden picked himself up and dusted off their armor. Across town, in South City, Michelle Weems looked out from the construction elevator as it descended in the paling afternoon sun. The skyline made her feel obsolete. The older buildings, designed by humans, were symmetrical and orderly. The new ones, climbing high above them, created by generative algorithms, looked more like plants. They were characterized by permutations rather than patterns. Many of them were moving, slowly oscillating to keep up with the sun, drinking in as much solar energy as possible. They had lumpy, bone-like joints. Not a single line was straight, everything looked hand-drawn and improvised. And yet, Michelle knew they were structurally stronger and more efficient. Michelle was a tall, stoic black woman who looked older than her 20 years. She felt out of place in a hard hat. She had wanted to study architecture when she was younger, before everything went sideways. Not that there was much call for architects these days. People didn't think in a way that allowed them to design like AIs did. She felt lucky to be working on the cranes, to have a job that wasn't completely menial. Michelle felt there wasn't much beyond that, left in this world for someone like her to do, except get through another day without using. The elevator reached ground level of the construction site. Michelle yawned and scratched at the scar behind her ear from the upgrade she'd had a few months ago. The jagged ribs of the new skyscraper she was working on towered through the fog at her back. She took off her hard hat as she headed out onto Market Street. Her Lumen OS display came to life. She perused messages and notifications via icons and bubbles blossoming around her as she walked. Opening Lumen OS after a long night felt like splashing warm water on her face. Streams of news, media, and chat cascaded around her like confetti. A headline about the president refusing to sign the ACRA protocol irritated her. She hadn't heard back from her brother Koth on the job opening on the cranes. That was annoying too. She forgot all this a second later when a notification on a dating app from a girl she'd been DMing popped up. Endorphins bathed her brain. Impulses were triggered. Emotion spiked and dipped. It felt like a hit. Michelle knew better. Even little hits of media were risky when she was tired. Metaverse addiction was a common problem, one Michelle had succumbed to at a young age. But thanks to VRAA and a daily dose of medication, she had been away from the hard stuff for almost four years. One day at a time. It was when she closed her feed that she saw the marshals getting out of a riot wagon up ahead. She tensed but kept walking. Whatever was happening, it wasn't about her, she told herself. She was just a crane operator finishing her shift. Running for marshals wasn't part of her day anymore. But getting stopped never ended well for her. She was clean now, but her rap sheet remained colorful. It was time to go. Michelle walked over to the PRT stop, where she was meeting Camila, just fast enough to not look suspicious. Personal rapid transit pods ran through the city on the old tram lines. They looked like drug capsules on wheels. Michelle kept a low profile, waiting for the next PRT pod to arrive. She heard the faint whirring of an electric motor approaching and turned, expecting to see a pod approaching. Before she could react, the whirring grew into something else, the familiar and frightening whine of high-powered rotor blades. This is a routine security check. Please stay where you are. The panic drone boomed from above, causing Michelle to jump. She looked up as the panic began scanning her and the rest of the people around her on the street, its rotors blowing dust and trash around them. To ensure your family's safety, only use approved proto products and software. The panel barked in the same voice as its two-legged martial cousins. Any unauthorized downloading, printing, minting, or growing can result in fines or imprisonment. Like a marshal, 
Panops also had red and white armor plating. They had hunched backs and clusters of blue bug eyes, looking in every direction. They came equipped with twin ADS heat cannons. An old white guy started shouting something at the drone about his rights. Stay where you are. The panop ordered again. The marshals up ahead had noticed. They fanned out, marching towards them. The old white guy kept shouting. Michelle stared daggers in his direction. She wanted to tell him to shut up, but knew better than to shout at anyone when a panop was circling. The old man was pointing now too. The drone hovered lower, moving towards him. Michelle's heart drummed in her chest. She couldn't be here. Michelle? Said a familiar voice. Michelle spun around to see Camila, her VRAA sponsor. Camila was a petite Mexican woman in her 50s, sweet and strong, with bright, kind eyes. She had a lot of time clean, and it showed. Although right at this moment, Camila looked as confused as everyone else on the street about what was happening. A PRT pod whined as it pulled up to the stop. A young couple emerged. They looked up from their feeds too, startled by the drone and the old man who had now picked up a rock from the gutter. Michelle panicked. She grabbed Camila by the arm and darted into the glass pod. The panop instantly turned on her. Stay where you are. It screamed. What are you doing? Shouted Camila. Michelle wanted to explain. She knew this was a terrible idea, but her brain was in flight mode. She wasn't getting arrested or shot again. She set the destination for South City. Just as she did, the old guy launched the rock he was holding at the panop. The drone twisted in the air as the rock dinged its hunched body, instantly locking on the old guy and firing. The man's shouting became screaming as ripples of heat pounded him into the ground. Michelle knew this was her only chance. She hit go, and the PRT pulled away. Michelle and Camila looked back as the pod lurched forward. People shrieked and ran. The Marshall platoon moved in on the crumpled, unconscious body of the old man. What the hell was that? Asked Camila as they pulled out of the city, gaining speed as the pod headed towards the 101 freeway. I'm sorry, I... Started Michelle, catching her breath, wiping the sweat beating on her forehead. I just freaked out Camila. I've been caught up in the wrong situation like that too many times. Camila leaned forward and put a hand on her. That's not you anymore, mommy. You did not do anything wrong. You're clean. She smiled. You don't run like that. Bad idea. Michelle shook her head and looked out the window, biting her lip. She knew Camila meant well, but being a young black woman was not the same as being an older Mexican woman in 2037 San Francisco, and she did not have the energy to get into all that right now. Through the windows, she noticed another flock of panops hovering over the freeway traffic as they sped away from downtown towards South City. It doesn't matter that I'm clean, Michelle answered. You know how those algorithms are. You're right, Camilla conceded, like she was talking to a seven-year-old. Security algorithms do treat the average black or brown person worse than the average white person. But we ain't average, Mitchell. We are addicts. And I'm an addict with a record twice as long as yours. Those things see that the moment they look eyes on us. So we can't use Tron. Not anymore. Everything that happens now, we must stand and face honestly. We must do the right thing and trust that we will be okay. That's what recovery is about. Michelle took this in. If they had come after us, I don't even want to think about what would have happened. Camila continued. A scowl flashed across her face. Don't you ever put me in situation like that again, you hear? Michelle nodded. She didn't like this. Camila was rarely mad at her. Michelle had met Camila when she washed up at VRAA, sent there by a court order when she was 15, after a week-long binge landed her in the hospital. Sure, she got a tone-deaf lecture every now and then. But she loved Camila. She'd be dead by now if it wasn't for her. I have not seen you all scared and jittery like this in a while, said Camila, her face softening again. Remind me of how you were when you came in. Camila probably had a better memory of that time in Michelle's life than she did. Michelle remembered weighing nothing from the suppressants. But aside from that, her teens were a blur of bad VR trips, 
worse drugs, and a bag of dangerous situations she got into to feed her habit. Camilo was searching her face. What's wrong, honey? What's going on? Outside, the silhouette of South City came into view as the PRT snaked down the 101 freeway. The sun was sinking behind the mountains. Michelle thought there seemed to be more riot wagons amongst the city traffic than usual. I don't know. It's just, some days, I don't know what the point is, you know? Michelle answered. I go to my job. I'm almost the only human there. I worry about Koth. I try to help him, but all he wants to do is play broadside and run around making money in sketchy ways, so we argue. And then, I wake up and do it all over. I thought life would be bigger than this somehow. I just want things to change. She thought on this for a second and shrugged. Maybe that's why I ran. I used to run from everything, said Camila. I was allergic to real life, so I checked out. When deep let me forget who I was, how I felt, and the hard truths I did not want to face. Running was easy. Destroying it all was easy. Facing bats in front of me? Really dealing with it? That's some hard work. Michelle nodded. There were a lot of people in VRAA with all kinds of metaverse addictions, but Camila and Michelle had been hooked on the most destructive stuff. Going deep they called it. By hooking into full immersion VR software and Lumen OS and ingesting a cocktail of brain stimulants and appetite suppressants, you could live in a virtual fantasy of your choosing for almost as long as you wanted, or more precisely, for as long as you could afford. Going deep had taken a toll on Michelle at a young age. She'd woken up in the emergency room almost as many times as she had in the cells at Tenderloin Police Station. I'm trying, Michelle said. I'm grateful. Life is better now, you know? But when I get in a situation like that, it's like I snap back to the old me. I'm lucky Koth doesn't remember the way I was. He's lucky to have you, said Camila, giving her a squeeze. The way you braced him. And you're damn lucky. That old guy was such a good shot with that rock. They smiled at each other. Michelle felt better. Her pulse wasn't racing anymore. The danger was behind them. Home was up ahead. The pod turned off at the exit and headed into the South City slums, snaking past the giant white letters on Sign Hill, Dat Red, South San Francisco, the industrial city. The sign was a Bay Area landmark, which had stood above the South City since the 1920s. Now the sign hung in the shadows, dwarfed by what South City had mutated into. Reaching high into the sky, surrounding the hill, was a series of grimy, haphazard towers. The evolution of the last 30 years of DIY building design was all there to see, one layer of slum, 3D printed on top of another. They were self-replicating barrios, reaching towards the heavens, like giant anthills. These citadels were, by and large, residential. Washing lines and flags hung from balconies. Precarious walkways connected the towers at different levels. Drones and neon adverts hung around them like flies. If the AI designed buildings downtown were exotic plants, the slum towers were weeds. We are late, Camila said, glancing at the time. Michelle noticed a printer crane teetering on the side of a tower, busy tacking on new units. It squeezed molten ceramic lines from its nozzle like toothpaste, joining the lines together into geometric shapes. Look at this mess, she tutted. You see how dangerous that is? People out here working with no training. Definitely no insurance. So maybe go help them? Said Camilla. Be of service. Maybe that helped your life feel bigger. The PRT slowed, crawling into the Sign Hill neighborhood. Michelle shook her head. I can't get caught building anything without a permit down here. She trailed off when she saw two marshals waiting for them. Stay calm. Ordered Camilla. But she looked scared too. Michelle's pulse was a jackhammer. She climbed out into the bustling street. The air hung thick and hot. She held her breath. The marshals eyed them as they passed, but said nothing. Michelle breathed out. Camila squeezed her hand again as they crossed the street. Calmete, calmete. Trust your higher power. They're not here for you. Let's go. Camila waved to some other members of VRAA, 
filing into the building ahead of them where the meeting was, an abandoned shopping mall that served as a makeshift community center. Michelle looked around. The street was dotted with marshal patrols and panops as far down as she could see, scanning and searching through the crowds. They never usually came this far into the slums. She turned back to Camila. Then what are they looking for? On the other side of South City, Michelle's brother Koth was suiting up at the warehouse space where his team usually played. His back ached, fresh off his shift at the bubble kitchen. He pulled his bone suit on over his work t-shirt, annoyed that Omar and the others weren't there yet. The game started in ten minutes. He messaged Omar. Where you at, B? He saw three flashing dots in the corner of his eye that indicated Omar was writing back. Then a phone icon flashed. Omar was calling. Yo. You didn't hear? Hear what? Said Koth. We got a game. Why is no one here? Man, forget the regular ass game. Come over to Hillside Park. What? Omar, this is a league game. Bro, forget the league. Everyone is here. Look, we're not supposed to talk about it online. Just come to the park. You gotta see this. Koth sighed, hung up, and grabbed his bag. Jaden, Riz, and Carlos cooled off on Jason's patio by the pool. The late afternoon sun was wearing thin. They sat helmets off, swigging waters, as they watched two other teams play on the sprawling lawn. The backyard was full of young broadsiders, who kept arriving as word continued to spread. Jason swaggered over. You know, that's two days in a row, we drag nuts all over you guys. He said with a big grin. They all ignored him, continuing to watch the game. Jason looked over at the game too. Whatever. He continued. But this little game we cooked up is pretty freaking fuego, right? Jaden felt their blood get hot, hating it when others tried to take credit for things they did. We? What did you do? Jaden frowned at Jason. Other than tell the whole world about it. First off, I gave your broke ass a place to play it. Jason shot back. You know how much trouble I could get in for this? And anyway, in case you hadn't noticed, the whole world is making broadside even better. Jaden swigged their water and looked away, shaking their head. Jason snorted and walked away. Riz pulled up the Anon wallet Jaden had set up. It was all encrypted, bouncing through several different exchanges, all decks of course, and wallets, with pseudonyms, fake IDs, and VPNs deployed at every turn. There was no way anyone could trace them. Jaden looked at it wide-eyed. It was overflowing with ETH, like it had just hit the jackpot, as both donations from grateful broadsiders and secondary revenue from NFT weapons and armor sales poured in. The trio exchanged excited glances. There was enough here to pay the broadside league fine, cover the rent, and then some. Jaden's smile faded as they looked across the lawn. There were teams here now all in different permutations of armor, sharing the hack game, making improvements, minting, printing, and selling their own NFTs, and passing the code on for free. The more people shared it for free, the more money was pouring in. So many people know. Jaden said. It hasn't even been a day. Carlos looked around too. Don't worry, he said, trying to sound reassuring. It's a game. We just created a whole new economy for them. This is the best broadside expansion pack they ever had. You should get, like, best Oscar for DLC. Proto won't send the cavalry over this. They're coming with the checkbook fam, trust. Riz nodded too, putting a hand on Jaden's. It'll be fine, she said. Jaden looked at their hand-touching Riz's, then up into her big brown eyes, smiling back at her with a nod. Riz looked at Carlos, who was looking at them both, unamused. Riz moved her hand and looked the other way. 